سنا ہے بولے تو باتوں سے پھول جھڑتے ہیں سنا ہے بولے تو باتوں سے پھول جھڑتے ہیں یہ بات ہے تو چلو بات کر کے دیکھتے ہیں عزیزان محترم استقبال کریں تالیوں کی گونج میں محترم ویلیم ڈیل ریمپل صاحب کا Adab and good morning. I'd like to open by taking you back to 1975 and uh, the young V.S. Naipaul visiting for the first time the ruins of Vijayanagara. It's 25 years before Naipaul will win the Nobel Prize and it's his first encounter with the civilization of the Deccan. In A Wounded Civilization, he describes his passage through the great plateau and the gigantic boulders like the ones outside here. These days, he explains, Vijayanagara, Hampi, is just a peasant wilderness, is what he calls. But look carefully, and you can see scattered everywhere the signs of former greatness. Palaces and stables, a royal bath, a temple with a cluster of musical columns that can be played, the leaning granite pillars of what must have been a bridge across the river. Over the bridge and beyond the river, there is more yet. A long avenue, and at the end, a miracle, a temple that for some reason was spared destruction 400 years ago and is still whole and still used for worship. Naipaul goes on in the book to lament the fall of what he calls this great center of Hindu civilization, then one of the greatest cities in the world. It was pillaged, he says, in 1565 by an alliance of Muslim principalities, and the work of destruction took five months, some people say a year. It fell, according to Naipaul's analysis, because, he says, the Hindu society it embodied had become backward-looking and stagnant. It had failed to develop, and in particular, it had failed to develop the military means to challenge the aggressive Muslim sultanates around it. Naipaul saw the fall of Vijayanagara as a paradigmatic wound on the psyche of India, part of a long series of failures that, according to Naipaul, still bruises the country's self-confidence. The wound, in his view, was created by a fatal combination of what he calls Islamic aggression and Hindu weakness. The origins of Naipaul's understanding of Vijayanagara has its roots in the his imperial historiographies of the British Empire, the British like to see the Muslims in Britain, in, in India, and their invasions as a long sequence of rapine and pillage. In strong, strong contrast, so the British like to assure themselves to the law and order brought by themselves, the civilizing mission. In this context, the fall of Vijayanagara was written up in elegiac terms by British historians such as Robert Sewell, whose 1900 book, Vijayanagara, A Forgotten Empire, first characterized the, the kingdom as what he called a Hindu bulwark against Muslim conquest. He saw it as a single brave but doomed attempt at resistance. This idea was eagerly picked up and elaborated by the Hindu nationalists of the early 20th century, who wrote of the empire as a Hindu state dedicated to the containment of Islam. It's a simple vision, and one that at first, like, first sight looks plausible. Naipaul's musings are, as ever, eloquently written. The problem is that these ideas rest on a whole set of assumptions, which scholarship in recent years has done a huge amount to undermine. An essay published in 1996 by the American scholar Philip Wagoner is an important landmark in this process of revisionism. The essay, entitled A Sultan Among Hindu Kil Kings, is a reference to the title by which the kings of Vijayanagara referred to themselves and pointed out the degree to which the elite culture of Hampi was, perhaps surprisingly, heavily Islamicized by the 16th century. Its civilization, quotes, deeply transformed by nearly two centuries of intense and creative interaction with the Islamic world. By this period, for example, the Hindu kings of Vijayanagara appeared in public audience not bare-chested, as had been the custom in Hindu South India, but instead dressed in a quasi-Islamic court costume, the Islamic-inspired kabiyah, 
a long sleeved tunic derived from the Arab Kaaba, and the kulayi, a high conical cap of brocaded fabric derived from the Perso Turkish kula, all part, according to Wagner, of their symbolic participation in the more universal culture of Islam. Far from being the final, stagnant, backward looking bastion of Hindu resistance imagined by Naipaul, Vijayanagara had in fact developed in all sorts of dramatic and unexpected ways, taking on much of the administrative, tax collecting, and military methods of the Muslim sultanates around it, notably stirrups, horseshoes, horse armor, and a new type of saddle, all of which allowed Vijayanagara to put into the field an army of fearsome horse archers who held at bay those of the Delhi Sultanate, then the most powerful force in India. Only a short time before the Deccani Sultan Sultanates turned on Vijayanagara, the Hindu Empire had been a prominent part of different a, a different Muslim alliance that had sacked the Sultanate of Ahmednagar when Hindu and Muslim armies stabled their horses in the mosques and plundered the city. Vijayanagara was, in reality, a victim to shifting alliances in Deccani power politics, not some concerted communal campaign by Muslim states intent on wiping out Hinduism. A comprehensive survey of Vijayanagara's monuments and archaeology, conducted by George Michel and John Fritz over the last 20 years, has confirmed the thrust of Wagner's thesis. The survey has emphasized the degree to which the buildings of the, in the 16th century, Vijayanagara, were inspired by the architecture of the nearby Muslim sultanates, such as Gulbaga and Bida, dropping the traditional Trabiat architecture of the Hindu south in favor of the arch and dome of the Islamic world, as well as borrowing specific ground plans and vaulting, plaster-coated masonry and arabesques. Moreover, this fruitful interaction between Hindu and Muslim ruled states was very much a two-way traffic. Just as Hindu Vijayanagara was absorbing Islamic influences, so a similar process of hybridity was transforming the nominally Islamic Sultanate of Bijapur. In both Imperial British and Hindu nationalist historiography, Bijapur traditionally has been seen one of the, as one of these violent and iconoclastic Muslim Sultanates which united to wipe out Vijayanagara. The medieval reality was very different. The landmark study of medieval Bijapur is Richard Eaton's remarkable book, Sufis of Bijapur. The picture revealed by Eaton's work is of a city dominated by an atmosphere of wild, heterodox sensuality, with the libraries of Bijapur swelling with esoteric and often heretical texts produced on the intellectual frontier between Islam and Hinduism. One Bijapuri production of the period, for example, was the Bangab Nama, or the Book of the Pot Smoker, written by Mahmud Bari, a sort of medieval Allen Ginsberg. The book is a long panegyric to the intoxicating effects of cannabis. Smoke your pot and be happy, be a dervish, and lose your heart at peace. Lose your life in imbibing this exhilaration. In the course of this book, Bari writes, God's knowledge has no limit, and there is not just one path to him. Anyone from any community can find God up to the extent of his own knowledge and what his own knowledge will permit. This certainly seems to have been the view of Bijapur's ruler, the Sultan Ibrahim Adil Shah II. Early in his reign, Ibrahim gave up wearing jewels and adopted instead the Rudraksh of the Hindu holy man. In his songs, he used highly Sanskritized language to shower equal praise upon Sarasvati, the Hindu goddess of learning, and the prophet Muhammad, and the Sufi saint Jezudaraz of Gulbaga. Perhaps the most surprising passage occurs in the 56th song, where the sultan more or less describes himself as a Hindu god. He's robed in saffron dress, his teeth are black, his nails are red, and he loves all. Ibrahim, whose father is the god Ganesh, whose mother is Sarasvati, has a rosary of crystal around his neck and an elephant as his vehicle. According to the art historian Mark Zabrowski, it is hard to label Ibrahim either a Muslim or a Hindu. Rather, he has an Eastleet's admiration for the beauty of both cultures. This same syncretic spirit also animates Bijapuri art, whose miniature portraits of princes show, according to Zabrowski, a noble gravitas 
which upholds the humanism of the Indian figural tradition, especially apparent in Gupta sculpture 1,000 years before. More remarkably still, for a nominally Islamic art, one finds, in the words of Zabrowski, girls as voluptuous as the nudes of South Indian stone sculpture. And as in so much Hindu art, we sense the warm breezes, luxuries, and languid pace of a tropical world. It's a similar story with the architecture of Bijapur, especially the tomb of Ibrahim himself, completed in 1626. From afar, it looks uncompromisingly Islamic, but for all its domes and arches, the closer you draw, the more you realise that few Muslim buildings are so Hindu in their spirit. The usually grim and austere walls of Islamic architecture in the Deccan are here giving way to petrified skullwork, indistinguishable from Hindu decoration. The bleak, black, volcanic granite of Bijapur, manipulated as if it were as soft as plaster, as delicate as a lace ruff. All around, minars suddenly bud into bloom. Walls dissolve into bundles of pillars. Any of the different styles of Indo-Islamic art and architecture almost always involves some degree of accommodation between the indigenous art of native Hindu India and the new ideas brought to South Asia by the incoming Muslims. But just as Urdu, the language which fused the Sanskrit-derived tongues of Hindu India with the Arabic and Persian of the newcomers, became a literary language first in the Deccan, not in its later North Indian heartland. So it was in the Deccan that a genuine fusion between the two rival aesthetics first took place. This picture of Hindu-Muslim hybridity, of an Indo-Islamic intellectual and artistic fecundity, is important as it comes in such stark contrast to the received wisdom, articulated perhaps most elegantly by Naipaul, that for India, the medieval period was a long tale of defeat and destruction, a period which, seen from afar, should be distinguished by the long pillars of smoke rising from burning temples and lines of Hindu slaves being driven off to Babylonish captivity in Delhi. But it's important to remember that the brilliantly plural and syncretic civilization of the Deccan was not just a mixture of Hindu and Indian Muslim there were more exotic elements in the mix, too. Successive generations of Deccani artists looked direct to the heart of the Islamic world, bypassing the experiments of Mughal North India to borrow Islamic elements direct from the tile work of the distant Ottomans or the architectural models of Central Asia. In cities like Bidar, one still finds intact perfect little fragments of the civilization of Bukhara and Samarkand, melaned ribbed domes that might happily have topped the tomb of Timur himself, fragments of tile work which are clearly influenced and sometimes rival that of Iznik, even a madrasa that would not look in the least a bit out of place in Safavid Isfahan. This direct Middle Eastern influence is there in the paintings of the Deccan too in the formality of the courtly scenes, in the fashions that the courtiers wear, in the narrowness of the eyes of the languid youths who lounge in the paradise gardens. In politics, this admiration for Middle Eastern ways sometimes called considerable friction, setting the immigrant communities of Persians and Afghans against the Indian-born Dakni nobility. Indeed, one Bijapur Sultan was so captivated by Persian culture and manners that he went as far as making his officers wear the Shia headdress and included the name of the Safavid Shah in the Friday prayers in the Qutbah. But in the art of this period, these Middle Eastern and Persian influences are effortlessly combined with the sense of plenty and opulence that is unique to the art of the Deccan. Water drips from the fountain. The flowers bend in the bees. Peacocks call from overladen mango trees. There is a sense of timelessness and calm. Nothing about these charmed garden scenes indicates that the moguls might ride into the outskirts at any minute, burning and pillaging. For all the borrowings, the consistent use of Persian models, the harsh deserts of the Middle East seem even further away. By the 16th century, 
the syncretic civilization of the Deccan was absorbing other influences too. Within 50 years of their arrival in Goa, the Portuguese were being absorbed into the civilization of the Deccan too. The Goan women, the environment, the sheer distance of Goa from Europe all worked on the new Portuguese arrivals so that gradually, generation by generation, they began to take on the customs of India and abandon those of Portugal. Already by the time, uh, by 1560, Goa more closely resembled the Mughal capitals of Delhi and Agra than Lisbon or any other city in Portugal. As one shocked Jesuit reported back to Rome, the Christians here lived together with the Muslims, the Jews, and the Hindus. And this causes a laxness of consciousness in persons residing therein. By 1560, the grandees of Goa dressed ostentatiously in silks, shielding themselves with umbrellas, never leaving their houses except accompanied by a vast revenue of servants. Travellers reported how the Goan aristocracy kept harems, and even the Christian women wore Indian clothes inside the house and lived in Perda, quotes, little seen abroad. If they had to go out, they did so veiled or in modestly covered palanquins. The Portuguese menfolk soon began to chew betel nut, to eat rice, but only with their right hand, and drank arak. They rubbed themselves with sweet sandalwood, and the hospital doctors prescribed the old Hindu panacea of cow's urine three times a day. In order, quote, to recover their colour, one glass in the morning, one at midday, and one in the evening. They drank water from the pot in the Indian fashion, and this is a lovely quote, and touch it not with their mouths, but the water running from the spout falleth into their mouths, never, dripping, never spilling a drop. And any man that cometh newly from Portugal and begin, beginneth to drink after this manner, because he is not used to this kind of drinking, he spilleth it on his bosom, wherein they take great pleasure and laugh at him, calling him Reynol, which is a name given in jest to any newly come from Portugal. And the posterity of the Portugals, both men and women, do seem to be natural Indians, both in colour and in fashion. Many Portuguese began to emigrate from Goa to make their fortunes in the great courts of the Deccani interior. Attached to the Adil Shahi court of Bijapur, for example, there was Gonzalo Vaz Coutinho, formerly a powerful landowner in Goa, who was imprisoned on a murder charge in Goa before escaping to Bijapur and converting to Islam. There he was given, quote, lands with great revenues, where he remained as a perfect Moor with his wife and children. It was also in these sultanates of the Deccan that the first English converts to Islam tended to make their way when, a century later, large numbers of Englishmen began to arrive in the Deccan for the first time. One eyewitness account of the earliest of defections was written by an early English trader called Nicholas Withington. His account gives a clear picture of the number of independent Europeans on the loose in India, but particularly in the Deccan, in the early 17th century, all of them intent on making their fortunes and quite prepared, if necessary, to change and change again their clothes, political allegiances, and their religions. It also showed the dangers that were inherent in undergoing circumcision, the single biggest obstacle for many potential converts to Islam. And this is a quote from Nicholas Withington's letters. There came likewise unto us one that had formerly run away from our ships to the Portuguese, and again from them to us. In this way, passing through the Deccan country, he was persuaded by another Englishman that was turned more to live there and to turn more like him, which he did and was circumcised, the king allowing him seven shillings, six pence per day, and his diet at the king's own table. But within eight days after his circumcision, he died. Likewise, another of our company, a trumpeter called Robert Truly, went to the Deccan of King thereof, carrying along with him a German as his interpreter who understood the language of the country, and coming there, offered both of them to turn more, which was kindly accepted by the king. So Truly was circumcised and had a new name given to him and a great allowance given to him by the king with whom he continued. So there were with the king of the Deccan four Englishmen who are turned Muslims 
and diverse Portuguese too. This process continues. Contrary to the legends imposed retrospectively by the Victorians, many of the English in India in the 17th and 18th centuries took on Islamic ways of life, Indo-Islamic culture, uh, and many other forms of the culture here. In my book, White Mughals, I've written about one of them, James Achilles Kirkpatrick, story famous to everyone here in Hyderabad, his falling in love with Karen Nisa, the uh, great niece of Mir Alam, uh, the uh, wazir of Nizam Ali Khan, and the story of his love for her, how he lived in, the, um, in her own Rang Mahal at the back of the uh, British Residency Building, now the Osmania Women's College. But while researching that book and coming here at, in the late 90s to look at all the archives and to pull that story together, uh, one came across in the sources over and over again this picture of a Hyderabad which was far more syncretic than any account I had read would have led me to believe up to then. It was a world which mixed to an incredible degree, street by street, mahalla by mahalla, Hindu, Deccani, Middle Eastern, Persian, European, English, Portuguese influences. In one of Kirkpatrick's first letters on his arrival at the Nizam's Durbar, he talks about how the Muslims here look like Hindus, shave close and wear small turbans, long gowns like Peshwas, and carry their hair near the ear in the regular way of Hindus. You can't tell in the Deccan a Hindu from a Muslim in the way that you can in Mughal Delhi. You feel the syncretism perhaps most dramatically in Kirkpatrick's descriptions of the different festivals of Hyderabad. The annual pilgrimage to Mullah Ali was the biggest annual pilgrimage of its day. A line of lamps was lit on either side of the way, all the way from the Chamina to Koe Sharif, the shrine of Mullah Ali. Haloed in dust, much of the population of the city and indeed the surrounding towns and villages of whatever faith would set off on foot, on bullock cart, in palkis and on elephant back, to the green and verdant stretch of country enclosed in a bend of the river Musi and bounded by a group of three small volcanic hills, one large and one, uh, one much smaller. Amid the smell of sweat and spices, elephant dung and wafts of hot cooking from the roadside stalls, the great nobles of the Deccan rub shoulders with trinket shellers and stable boys, soldiers and sepoys diamond merchants, and the clerks of the Nizam's daftar. The festival was celebrated by all the inhabitants, whether Sunni, Shia, or Hindu, and everyone bought sacred threads to tie around their wrists and ate the prasad given to them by the prasadas. Hindus came with coconuts to bring as offerings to the shrine. Muslims brought sheep to slaughter. Beggars lined up for alms. According to the Hyderabadi historian Ghulam Hussein Khan, all of God's peoples go, from the Nizam and his ministers to the poor, the soldiers and the entertainers, even the old women of 90 and 100 who could hardly have the strength to walk, yet still they drag themselves to the festivities. About five lakh people, Muslims and Hindus, followers of Vishnu and Shiva, Brahmins and Sadhus and Mawaris, as well as foreigners from Iran and Central Asia and Turkestan, Ottoman Turkey and Syria, Arabs and non-Arabs, and even the English, all of them come to this Urs, which none of them will willingly miss. Even each of the nobles endows mansions that are named after them. And in the days after the Urs, numbers of officers, accompanied by the Nizam and ministers to their lodgings, swell. And there are people from all over the world. For three days, a sea of humanity as far as anyone can see. Some 3,000 large elephants and baby-faced elephants, as well as 50,000 horses and load-bearing camels, oxen, carts, and numberless mules are there, with stalls selling fresh and dried fruit, clothes and fine woolen pashmina shawls. Beautiful dancers with variously painted faces and rich jewels and bright-colored dresses entertain joyful gatherings and astonish listeners with their ravishing music. There are fireworks, 
delicious dishes of food and drink beyond counting. Tents of the Amirs and courtiers cover all the flanks and surroundings of the noble hill. When His Highness the Nizam enters, the celebrations and the illuminations begin. Even more dazzlingly plural was the way the Hyderabadis celebrated Muharram. According to the Iranian traveller Abdul Latif Shushtari, who came to visit his cousin, the Nizam's Vakil Mir Alam, Muharram in Hyderabad bore not the slightest resemblance to the festivities he had grown up with in the solidly Shia environment of Iran. Instead, they'd been transformed into some sort of syncretic Indo-Muslim Saturnalia, which was almost as common, which had almost as much in common with the Hindu Reva festivals, such as the Kumela, as they did with the purely Muslim Muharram. Not only were the Tazias carried in chariots modelled on Hindu temple chariots, the styles of worship were also borrowed from the Hindus. I have seen with my own eyes, wrote Abdul Latif Shustri, how the Muslims in India copy Hindu styles of mourning, fasting, and prostrating themselves in the Ashokanas. The two groups compete in self-mortification, wounding their chests and flagellating themselves till the blood flows and they fall unconscious. In Hyderabad, Muslims and Hindus utter incomprehensible cries during the mourning ceremonies. More bizarre still, the lower orders disguise themselves, going around in animal skins, some as cam camels, some as lions, and so on, making grotesque gestures and setting up at crossroads and passages a standard of their quarter, under which they light a great fire. There both men and women, and these strange apparitions beat their breasts and dance. Ghulam Hussein Khan, the native Hyderabad historian of the 18th century, also describes the strange animist tradition of dressing up in animal skins during Muharram, that unlike the purest Iranian shustri, he regards it as a perfectly legitimate way of celebrating the festival. Most of the lower classes dress up as lions, he writes, and attach, a chain, attach with a chain a wooden codpiece to their waist as a lion's tail. Others take chains in their hands and wander about the street banging tambourines in and out of the ashokanas and bazaars. Some take sheep by the throat and bite them through the jugular veins so that blood spurts out, adding to their image of a, f a fierce, blood-covered lion. On the tenth day of Muharram, the martyrdom, most of them gather at the Purana Pool, the old bridge. Some go mad and wear hats with multicoloured streamers. At this time, two Ethiopians, young and well-built, gild their bodies with gold leaf and, wearing only a turban, rush out into the street with 25 other Ethiops and Arabs fully armed. All the other would-be lions become timorous foxes and pull in their codpieces, not daring to confront these two. If any dare to cut off their wooden tail and confiscate it, saying, don't even think of dressing up as a lion next year. In these celebrations, both Hindus and Muslims take part. And on the 10th, the actual day of the martyrdom, when all the alum standards and the tazia models and life-size wooden images of the Burak flying horses go down to the Hisseini alum to the Musa, accompanied by elephant standards and fanfares and guards of Arabs and Western-trained sepoys. Hindus and Muslims go by their thousands, all bareheaded and barefoot, beating their chests, crying, Hussein, Hussein. The Hindus in particular participate with full reverence, tying onto the alum standards garlands of flowers with their own hands. It's an incredibly detailed picture, neither of these sources has ever been translated out of Persian before, of a, a partly lost world of great syncretic uh, unity where the common festivals are celebrated with almost no um, division between the different faiths. The later Nizams preserved this strangely mixed heritage. After the fall of Lucknow in 1856, Hyderabad remained the last great center of Indo-Islamic culture and the flagship of Deccani civilization, with its long heritage of composite Qutb Shahi, Vijayanagaran, Mughal, Kakatian, Central Asian, and Iranian influences. Osmania University was the first in India to teach in, an, in indigenous Indian languages, and it was the way ahead of most other regions in India in the spread of education. In the early 20th century, it was the most important area for the growth of Urdu literature 
in the subcontinent, and the people of Hyderabad had evolved their own distinctive manners, habits, language, music, literature, food, and dress. I don't live in Hyderabad, and you all do, so it's not for me to tell you how much or little of this mixed culture survived the collapse of the Nizam's regime, the upheavals of the 1940s, Operation Polo, and the absor absorption of the Deccan into independent India. Mir Muazim Hussein, the first Hydri Hyderabadi gentleman and scholar I ever befriended on my first visit, though, took a very dim view and said that in his own lifetime, he'd seen a huge amount get lost. In 50 years, he told me on my first visit to Hyderabad in 1997, in 50 years, an entire world has been leveled. Utterly destroyed, he said. The process is nearly finished. I think that everything that is special about Hyderabad will go. Day by day, the old ways are disappearing. They are being replaced with a monotonous standardization. What we had in Hyderabad was a very distinct Deccani culture, the product of a very particular mixture of peoples and influences. But much of the old elite went to Pakistan or the Gulf, and the flood of new people have come, bringing their own ways with them. What is left is on its last legs, and now there is nothing anyone can do about it. This was also the view of an unexpected visitor to Hyderabad in the 1970s, Jackie Kennedy. She was brought here by the art historians Kerry Welsh and Mark Zabrowski, and after her visit, she recorded her impressions of this collapsing and leaderless courtly world in a beautiful private letter to her friend Zabrowski. I think it's an ex I look on Jackie Kennedy with new eyes after reading this letter. Listen to her, her description of an evening in Hyderabad. We had an evening with the old nobleman of the court, she wrote. Men with long white hands, transparent like alabaster, who recited Urdu poetry to us. The hereditary prime minister of Nizam, I think his name was Ali Pasha, had his own lime grove, such inbred trees that their leaves were translucent and the pan made with them unlike any other. There were three ancient classical musicians playing in the moonlight and the noblemen were speaking of how it was all disappearing, that the youth didn't appreciate the ways of the old culture, that the great chiefs were being taken to the emirates, that the great chefs were being taken to the emirates. This over-civilized world, you knew it was too rarefied to survive. The evening was profoundly sad. My son John told me the next day that the sons of the house had taken him to their rooms because they couldn't stand the classical music and had offered him a tall glass filled with whiskey and put on a pornographic cassette in the Betamax and the Rolling Stones on the tape deck. They wore tight Italian pants and open shirts and all the whiles their fathers on the terrace in beautiful Shavani's were speaking of how sad they made them. Ali Pasha's son had disappeared a year before on a motorcycle because he didn't like the marriage that had been arranged for him. It may or may not be too late to save much of what has been lost of this old and beautiful and rarefied Deccany world. But it's certainly not too late to study it. And this is one of the many reasons that I've been delighted to show my support for the HK Shawani Center of Deccany Studies by coming and giving this lecture today. In the view of the breathtaking beauty of so much of the work produced in the great courts of the Deccan, what is perhaps most remarkable about the historiography of the Deccany art and culture is still the relative absence of high-level scholarship of the sort pioneered by the astounding labours of Shawani Sab. Still, far too little serious work is being done on the Deccany courts. In an age when every minute contour of the landscape of art history appears to be rigorously mapped out with gridirons and PhDs, the gap in Deccany studies is all the more remarkable. 
the Deccan remains a major lacuna. For every book on the Deccani Sultanates, there are 100 on the Mughals. For every book on Hyderabad, there is a shelf on Lucknow. I hope very much the opening of this centre will begin to change this lamentable state of affairs and thank the Vice-Chancellor and the amazingly persistent Salma Faruqi for the opportunity to come here today and speak to you. Thank you very much.